You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Max Holleran to talk about his book, Yes to the City. We talk about the rise of YIMBY versus NIMBY housing politics, the changes in housing activism, and how housing fights are going global. Stay with us. As a Talking Headways listener, you know that U.S. transportation needs a major overhaul. I want to introduce you to a new podcast that dives deep into this very subject, with many of the voices that you love and trust. The modern American economy was built for cars. Not having access to one can put a person at a serious disadvantage. So what will it take to change the way we move around? Enter Mode Shift, a series that explores the past, present, and future of how we move. Hosted by global policy expert Andre Greenwald and transit entrepreneur Tiffany Chu, they dig into the forces that are holding our transit system back and the forces that could unleash it. Find and follow Mode Shift wherever you find your podcasts. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Thanks for supporting each month. We really appreciate it. To join this merry band of zoning nerds and infrastructure wizards, go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. $2 a month gets you some stickers and a handwritten note. $10 a month gets you one of our transportation scarves. Heavy knit bus or bike only or lightweight bike only with fading checkerboard design. Sign up at patreon.com slash theoverheadwire, and I'll send one right along. You can also purchase the scarves at theoverheadwire.com. Get your fresh Elmo or fresh Kermit before winter arrives. Order now at theoverheadwire.com. Also, because we do a lot of episodes covering a lot of books, we've partnered with bookshop.org as an affiliate. This means that if you buy a book through the Overhead Wire shop on Bookshop, a small amount of that purchase goes to us. Now, we love when you order from your local bookstores, but if you want to support the authors we have on the show, and help keep us interviewing them, that would be tremendous. All the books we've ever discussed on the show with the authors are now in the shop. That's bookshop.org slash shop slash The Overhead Wire. That's bookshop.org slash shop slash The Overhead Wire. And finally, check out The Overhead Wire daily newsletter, established in 2006. We were doing it way before anyone else thought it was cool. Join thousands of readers and sign up for a two-week trial at theoverheadwire.com to check it out. That's a two-week free trial at theoverheadwire.com. Well, Max Holler, and welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I am originally from the United States, but I've been living and teaching at the University of Melbourne in Australia. I teach social policy, and I have an emphasis on cities, urban planning, and urban problems that we're trying to solve. What's it like in Melbourne right now? Um, It was a long and hard lockdown there. I think that it bears the dubious honor of being the longest lockdown city with curfews and, uh, you know, one hour of exercise a day, a bit like taking a jog around the prison yard. But it's a gorgeous city. It's a really lucky city. It has a mixture of kind of beautiful row houses and parks with parrots in them. And it's a bit more temperate than the rest of Australia. So it's not always blindingly hot. And it has slightly fewer bushfires, which is, you know, as we all can remember from 2019, the whole continent has a habit of catching on fire. Yeah, we know that here in California as well. So tell me how you got into housing and urban issues. Is this something that began when you were a little kid or was it something that you picked up later on in life? I was always interested in housing and urbanism. I'm from a family where that's a focus. My dad's an architect. I lived in a lot of places that changed really dramatically. So I was born in Rhode Island, but I grew up mostly in Boulder, Colorado, which is a part of this book. And it's a kind of story, a bit of a cautionary tale when it comes to housing affordability. And I lived in New York for 15 years. So I've, I've kind of made my way around some places that are quite expensive and changing a lot. I also, for over a decade, wrote about cities in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe that were going through tremendous changes, joining the European Union, having people buy tourism houses there with the euro currency, and also, you know, changing because of post-socialist politics. So I kind of come at this actually from tourism, which is why I studied before I studied American housing markets. And you're being a tourist right now, apparently. <laughs> I am. I'm coming, yeah, I'm in Budapest right now. I'm actually working here. I have a fellowship here for almost a year. But yeah, it's a, it's a very touristic city and also one that is struggling with housing costs. Oh, like everywhere else. 
one thing that was interesting about the book, and we'll get to in a second, but one, one thing that was interesting in the book is that like you kind of follow some of my trajectory in, in life in terms of the places that you explored. I, I've never been to Melbourne or other places. I've been to a number of places in Europe that you talked about, and specifically Stockholm and other places like that. But I was born in Houston. I went to school at the University of Texas at Austin, and I was there from 1998 to 2005, which is a kind of a formidable time for you know light rail planning and stuff like that in the city. NIMBYism and all that entails. But also, I spent a summer in Boulder because I ran cross country at the University of Texas as well. And I had some friends at the University of Colorado who lent me and some friends a house where we stayed five people to one house, which I think is illegal. <laughs> but, it, it now, is, yeah. but it was for a summer and nobody seemed to mind. And then also, now I live in San Francisco, which is another place that you cover in the book. So I think it's interesting to see all the places that I've lived discussed in a Yimby NIMBY context, which is really fascinating. How did you choose the cities that you wanted to portray? So I was choosing cities that have a really like um, robust YIMBY movement. So places that have really come together under this banner of YIMBYism and have demanded new development. A lot of that is expensive cities. It's also cities that have desirable characteristics that people are moving there in droves and also really well-paying jobs. So one of the points that I tried to make in the book is that a lot of people are attracted to what I call successful cities. And I think we can kind of argue about that nomenclature, whether it's right or not. But what I mean by that is that the regional disparities we see in the U.S. are growing wider and wider. And the amount of money you can make in Milwaukee versus a Chicago or in a San Francisco versus a Reno, Nevada is a huge disparity. And so people get having the regional mobility to move out of state or to move to a big city in their state is not just about what they want to do culturally. It's not just about, you know, they want cool bars or they want more walkable spaces. It's also about what kind of job they can get and how much money they can make from that job. That's a good point. I mean, the Austin of the 90s and the late 90s, at least, and until I left was a place where, you know, there were a lot of people sleeping on couches and playing music on the weekends and doing all kinds of interesting things. And I don't know if that's actually possible these days with the housing prices the way they are. You know, people would be renting a trailer close to downtown for like 100 bucks a month or something along those lines and, and playing music on the weekends, like I said. And so that's interesting, you know, the change in terms of, you know, what people can afford when they come to a place where they really want to be culturally, but they maybe can't afford, you know, fiscally. Yeah, it's really sad because places like Austin that used to be like, you know, there's always kind of monikers for it, like a slacker paradise or this kind of like hippie cowboy psychedelic hippie city and you know you had people who because they were kind of reveling in this like laid-back culture were couch surfing and kind of like a bit footloose and free in terms of like where they were living and what their life structure was like now we see people who are couch surfing because they just can't afford anywhere else to go in those same cities so you know you and, and you see that demographically you see the people who are couch surfing, who are 24 and who are trying to get their lives together and figure out what they want to do with their life. Now you see people who are couch surfing who are 44 and have kids and have a full-time job, but just cannot figure out how to get an affordable roof over their head. Well, so the book is Yes to the City, Millennials and the Fight for Affordable Housing. What was the impetus for starting to think about yimbyism, nimbyism, and housing politics in cities? There's really two things. So for me, one of the big things is that I saw housing usually through the anti-gentrification movements. And so through people who were in neighborhoods that were getting really expensive and they were starting to talk about getting pushed out of those neighborhoods and being a, a kind of a form of dispossession. And a lot of that was also across racial lines. So people coming into neighborhoods that were majority people of color and buying homes there, renting homes there and changing the demographic makeup of that neighborhood, also with immigrant neighborhoods. That was a really big thing. You know, the Yimby movement is not that. The Yimby movement does not focus on gentrification. It looks at housing very much from a supply and demand standpoint and has a very simple argument, which is not about preserving a neighborhood or keeping the neighborhood's residents because they're, it's a place that they're emotionally attached to. It's very much just about building new housing. And so I think that was a really big shift for people who are in housing movements to see so many people 
with a very different set of talking points than they were used to. And the other thing is that for a long time, we've thought about housing in terms of class. We thought about people who were living in public housing. We thought about people who were experiencing homelessness and you know people who were who were really struggling and it was tied to how much money they had and i think that a lot of what yimbyism has done and a lot of these new housing movements has done is thinking about housing in terms of age and so they would say you know there's a whole new generation of people people born after you know 1990 basically who are really cursed when it comes to buying a home or to renting a home and it kind of universalizes it as a generational experience which is true and it's not true on one hand, you know, what they're saying is that housing has become more expensive and everyone suffers. That is true, but there's people who suffer a lot more. And those are people who are at the bottom end of the pay scale or unemployed. One of the themes of the book is that generational divide. I'm curious, you know, through your interviews and things, how did that keep coming up in terms of, you know, going from this class struggle to something that, you know, a group wanted to paint as a generational struggle in terms of, you know, boomers versus uh, millennials, to put it in crass uh, <laughs> terms that don't really fit, but, you know, kind of fit, like I guess. The terms that the movement uses, boomers versus millennials, most of them are, you know, like in their early 40s or under 40, and most of the people they're fighting are in their 50s or 60s or 70s. I think you could also say renters versus homeowners. There's another, there's a lot of different ways we could talk about this fight, but it's people who want to build more and people who want to build less or not at all. The YIMBY movement has very vociferously said that what we need to do is build more apartments. We need to densify existing urban neighborhoods. That might mean, you know, living next to an apartment, a small apartment building, which a lot of people don't like because it disturbs their sense of what suburbia should look like or, you know, what their block looked like in the past. And that's, you know, the movement is is very direct. What they want to say is that people who live in the nicest neighborhoods are controlling that space and they're selfishly hogging that space for themselves when they should be letting other people into those neighborhoods that are blessed with good transit, with nice amenities, with parks that are close to central areas. And they would say, you know, to people who live in these nice neighborhoods, they'd say, look, you don't live in a bucolic suburb, you live at the edge of a city or sometimes even in a city, and you need to, you know, come to terms with that urbanism. And they locate it as a generational thing, but also sometimes even farther back and talk about how all these Americans who live in the suburbs tell themselves they're living some sort of Jeffersonian dream away from the city when they're not. They're living next to a shopping mall. They're living next to a highway. They're not living, you know, out in the hills. They need to stop pretending like they are and let some new development come to their neighborhood. It was really interesting thinking about also, you know, the idea of of, NIMB, of YIMBYism, I should say. I keep, you know, one of the things that's problematic in terms of trying to define the coalitions is they're only one letter apart and it's hard to uh, hard to keep them out of it. When I was writing this book, my brother told me, you got to say YIMBYism and then NIMBYism. You have to always say not in my backyard and always spell it out or else it's going to make people completely mental, including, <laughs> including him. So <laughs> that was an editorial comment. Yeah. Well, also, you know, it's funny, you know, Liam Dillon, who's a reporter for the Los Angeles Times, covers housing politics. You know, he always often lists the number of isms that people have created in, in the wake of Yimbyism, Fimbyism, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see the number of isms that pop up in that way. But you mentioned them trying to kind of define rich neighborhoods as places where there needs to be more housing. But I'm wondering also how much the messaging was really important in terms of saying, you know, getting rid of single family zoning was kind of like a singular target, while also trying to produce uh, housing units in these in these neighborhoods, these Tony neighborhoods, where, you know, rich people often lived. The messaging is is incredibly important. And I will say, whatever you think about Yimbyism, and people have very, very powerfully held ideas about this movement, good and bad, that they have been incredibly successful in reframing this conversation and giving a new kind of nomenclature to how we talk about housing. Even the kind of proliferation of you know, building in churches' backyards and building in public, you know, public housing, even the, the way that they've owned the isms says so much about how successful they've been for a movement that's been around for just barely 10 years. So 
you know, their main goal has been to advocate for new development in wealthy neighborhoods that already have a good deal of infrastructure. They do that in two levels. Like one is very local. It's the kind of we show up at zoning board meetings where everyone is kind of, you know, saying I, I can't deal with the traffic this will produce and I can't deal with, you know, the shadows that this building will cast over my backyard. I don't think we have the resources in this neighborhood. And they come and they say, no, we do. And we need to build this. And they oftentimes get castigated as interlopers because they're not from that neighborhood. And their response is always, well, yeah, of course, we're not from that neighborhood because you haven't built any housing there and we can't afford to live there. On the other hand, they're incredibly policy savvy and they have a kind of lobbying wing. They have a state policy wing that is all about zoning laws. And they do have this very simple idea, which they would say is, you know, it's it's high time that we get rid of single family zoning because so many cities have it where even if people wanted to build in, you know, multi-family units, they wouldn't be able to. And so even townhouses are not allowed. And they would say that that's just a travesty that we're locked into suburbia, not just because we've spent so much money and built all these highways and built these houses, but because we've actually codified ourselves into this corner. And they'd say, you know, suburbia is not good for housing affordability because we can't produce enough housing. It's not good environmentally because everyone is car dependent and very few of these places are linked up to transit. And they would also say, you know, in the kind of most highfalutin kind of philosophical part of the movement, that this is a real social problem, that people are missing out on forms of neighborliness and civic cooperation and potentially even kind of bridging some of these massive political divides that we have because they live in these atomized neighborhoods with, you know, my house, my lawn and my fence, and they don't have to ever share anything with their neighbors. They don't have to ever take part in a community in a more fulfilling and substantial way. Well, that's an interesting part of the book, too, is that you go into how YIMBY is somewhat of a basis for a greater social movement and political participation away from just housing. It's kind of an entree to other things. And I'm wondering why do you think this is an entry point as opposed to like climate change or other, Mm -hmm. you know, big political struggles today? That's a great question. And um, I don't think I have a great answer for you. But the not great answer is that everyone has to pay their rent or their mortgage every month. And so there's something highly visceral about writing that check or making that bank transfer where people say, you know, God, that's a crazy amount of money. Why am I doing this? How am I doing this? How does this make sense? How is this massive part of my income going towards housing? Or, you know, God forbid that they should not have housing and your life is a search for stable housing, which is something that that's happening more and more and happening to demographic groups that we're not used to, like senior citizens. So I, I do think there's something about the fact that it's, it's a kind of stress that most people observe and can relate to that brings them into the movement because they've been personally affected by it. And of course, you know, the big argument with Yimbyism, Yimbyism is a very middle-class movement, Most of the people are really well-educated. A lot of them have backgrounds in tech, design, architecture, urban planning. And they would, you know, say, yeah, sure, we're not not a working class movement. We are middle class. That's true. And we have no qualms about admitting it. And I think they'd also say that the reason why that is, is because housing has jumped scales to becoming a middle class problem, which is people who are securely middle class making over a hundred grand a year and sometimes well more than that in places like the Bay area are suddenly concerned about paying their rent. And they would say, this is not something you would have seen 10, 20 years ago where someone who's on that kind of salary can find a place to live or the amount of money they're paying is like an existential threat to their well being. And they would say, that's why it's a middle class movement because this problem keeps growing and affecting people who used to be economically secure. Well, it seems that that kind of bleeds into the activism part, too. It feels like that class kind of divide and also the activist class, as it were. It feels like in the book specifically, you talk about how some of the activists might have been surprised that this new group of interlocutors (laughs) was coming in and kind of causing a stir and being more technocratic and focused on a singular subject. I'm wondering how 
you felt like the existing class of housing advocates responded? Yeah, I think they were nonplussed. It was a, a situation that was pretty fraught. I think that there wasn't a lot of communication between those two sides in some cases. And when there was communication, it got tense very quickly because it was about what neighborhoods are buildable. And that was where, you know, the people, I think there was a kind of detente where it's like, you know, you have the anti-gentrification groups that represent largely working class neighborhoods, a lot of people of color, and then you have the Yimby movements, which are a lot of white people skew kind of male as well in more middle class neighborhoods. And there was a sort of like, okay, you have your neighborhood, we have our neighborhood, and we'll try to work together, which I don't think ever really happened. And then you'd get these controversies, particularly in San Francisco, where you'd say, oh, okay, well, like, you know, we said we were going to build in neighborhoods that are, you know, securely middle class. But by the way, we want to build something in the Mission. By the way, we want to build something in Oakland. And that's, I think, when these two kinds of housing activism came into conflict and are still in conflict in person, online, and um, have uh, fundamental disagreements about what will make affordable housing happen in terms of economic policy, and also more superficial, but nonetheless sort of confrontational and acerbic problems online in real life between them, which has made you know, housing Twitter, which, you know, you think housing Twitter, it sounds like the most boring thing in the world. It sounds like housing economists like talking to each other about how many units they can build and how much should be subsized affordable. And in fact, it's a really nasty place. That has it's like the wild of, west. Yeah, it's a wild west. Yeah, it's like it's like the wild west of movies, not the actual wild west, but the wild west of movies. That you know, somebody walks into a bar and somebody looked at somebody funny, and yeah, you know, pull out your guns, go to the street, high noon, those types of things. Hopefully, nobody's pulling out guns. I'm not advocating. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes when you see the Twitter comments, it seems like it's uh, it's almost there. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it. But that also speaks to, you know, a little bit of the rancor and the discussions online, but also it feels like clearly now that there's kind of not a winner per se, but like the Yimby movement is starting to like get ahead or at least feel like they're having wins uh, is maybe the best way to, to phrase it. And recently at the state legislature here in California, there was a lot of wins that have been trumpeted by the Yimby folks online at least. And I think will make a huge difference, especially, I don't know if you've seen, you know, what happened yesterday, but there was a tweet yesterday about, you know, maybe 10 or so projects with thousands of, or, you know, hundreds of housing units in Santa Monica because their housing element is out of compliance. And so the chirping was, was kind of off the charts yesterday. And I, I don't think that the, the, the opposition was happy, but it seems like that there's been a, a number of wins for the Yimby movement. I'm curious how kind of their legislative movement has actually kind of built them into a force rather than just, uh, you know, a neighborhood by neighborhood organization that is fighting for individual projects? Their legislative wins, especially if you think about the Yimby movement is broadly conceived and consisting of dozens of different pro-density, pro-construction housing groups across the U.S. and across the world, it's been astonishing. They've had huge victories and they have been really instrumental in getting rid of single family zoning in entire cities and states. And also, you know, for instance, in California, advocating for new transit oriented development in ways that urban planners have been stressing we need to do for at least 25 years. But, you know, I think that there is a real art form with what they have done in attracting people online who don't really know about urban planning and don't really care, but suddenly you make it a meme about, you know, why can't we build a house here and look how much you're paying for rent and look at this schmuck who's talking about millennials can't afford houses because they're buying too much avocado toast and cappuccinos. And I think that they get this real momentum bringing people into a coalition that is, you know, basically advocating for some fairly wonky urban planning ideas but have, have really become powerful. And I think people really need to recognize that what they've done in the most visible way is go to meetings and yell at people and say, don't be selfish, allow someone to build an apartment unit on your block. But in a more momentous way, what they've done is created a kind of advisory board, a couple different think tanks, particularly in California, 
that are advocating for housing reform, for zoning reform in interesting ways and with a coalition of people who are not just urban planners. And I think that that gives them more voice. And that's why they have the mayor of San Francisco, a very powerful state senator, and other politicians who really listen to them and identify with them. And the persistence as well. I mean, you have a lot of losses along the way to wins, too. I mean, you have the alphabet soups, number soups, <laughs> SP 827, SP 50, those types of things. SP version X is what I'm going to call it from now on. And I don't even remember what the wins are because there's so many numbers that are stuck in my head. Yeah. But most of these wins and losses are just kind of codes. And I'm curious about how that kind of language and the coding of it, does that help or hinder the movement in that, you know, you're you're worried about this Senate bill or this assembly bill or this, you know, in California specifically, obviously there's things going on in other states, but it's really interesting to see how this kind of, like you mentioned, like really wonky topic that I care about a lot, obviously, as an urban planner has kind of gone into the mainstream. They've looped a lot of people into the political process. I mean, they have people who are coming to their happy hours and, you know, subscribing to their newsletters who wouldn't necessarily be interested in these different codes and would not have the staying power to bear with all these failed legislative bills, but they've sort of shown the stakes. I think that what I believe you've just alluded to is that they've done a lot of legislative maneuvering, but that doesn't equal building. So where are the shovel-ready projects? And that's a good question, which is that I think that they will come. You know, one thing I really like about Yimbyism is that I'm a big believer in public housing. I think the U.S. can have really beautiful public housing, but I also don't see most states or the federal government building much of it. So I think the one thing the Yimbyism really gets right is saying we're going to have development that's private development and we're going to have market rate housing built. But let's put a voice in there that tries to control the process and makes a level of affordability within market rate development. And when people are debating what's going to happen, let's make sure that we can have a voice and get some affordability in there and get some people at the table when it comes to developers building big buildings. And a lot of other housing movements have not been, I don't think they've been as clear-eyed about that. They've said like, you know, look at this gentrification, look at these developers. We hate developers. Developer is a nasty word, you know, boo, boo, boo. And then they've lost their seat at the table because something's going to get built anyway, but they're not there to demand community benefits from developers who have gotten the green light from zoning. And they're also not there to demand affordability within those projects. So I think that's one thing they'll probably have to do in the future when some people start acting on these new legislative victories. Switching gears a little bit, one of the interesting things about the book was the lessons about Boulder, to me anyway, specifically, because I'm fairly familiar with Austin, I'm fairly familiar with San Francisco and the history. I you know, live pretty close to a lot of where um, the action is here in Noe Valley, which is right adjacent to the mission. But one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is how basically we're, we're sitting in these cities that are kind of like pressure cookers. And I feel like the pressure cookers are starting to hit their limit. For a long time, there was these escape valves. And in Boulder and in Austin, in Austin, you know, North and South, and Megan Kimball, who is a journalist in Texas, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. But basically, you know, all of the nimbyism, the anti-development sentiments in central cities was allowed to go on because there was this escape valve of sprawl and suburbanism that was allowed to fester in places north and south of Austin and places outside of Boulder. But I feel like that that's come to a head. There was even a, a Wall Street Journal article recently. It's like the end of the land or the land is <laughs> not available anymore for this housing. And so how much of this movement is is basically, you know, kind of pushed up by this end of suburbia, N- not the end of suburbia as a way of building, but basically that cities are running out of places to uh, nimby their housing to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's always been that kind of like spatial fix in the U.S., which is like we live in this giant country. Let's just go explore some new land, not in the suburbs, but in the exurbs. And let's, you know, get people out there and they'll commute an hour and 45 minutes to work each way. But it's fine because we're Americans. We love driving. It'll all be okay. That land is harder to get to now. And a lot of it just isn't there. So you see increasingly cities where open land is coming into dispute between people who want to develop it, but also agriculture. So, you know, you get municipal authorities who are saying, whoa, 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 we can't give up 
you know, the agriculture that we have left because we have this big city and we have to feed the city. I think also some of these places, people are, are dealing with commuting times and gas prices that are no longer viable. I think there's also a level of dismay about being kind of banished farther and farther from the city. There's a sort of, you know, we're looking a lot more like European cities where the center is a very wealthy, prosperous place and the outskirts get progressively less so. And there's a feeling of being in exile. And I don't think that's a very good feeling that people, you know, don't like to travel a long ways. They don't like to feel like they're being banished from the city because they don't have enough money. But yeah, very much in, in Texas and Colorado, a lot of these places have expanded. They really have hit their limit in terms of transportation, commuting time, available land. And also, as you know, from California, you know, some of these places and in Texas as well, the reason why people haven't built in this land is because it's at risk, higher risk of fire or flooding. So, you know, Houston famously built all of their floodplains. So I think that densification is really the answer in a lot of cases. And I think a lot of people have come to terms with the idea of a kind of gentle densification in suburbs, which can work really well and which is not that onerous for the communities that are being asked to do it. I think that that's a real sea change from the 1990s and maybe early 2000s when there was still all this developable land. And I think uh, Yimbis have hit on that, which is that that philosophy really no longer works. There's no more satellite communities that you can build. And Boulder is a really good example of that, which is that because Boulder is so expensive and because it has a green belt around it, which provides all these absolutely amazing amenities in terms of hiking and running and, you know, whatever else, um, even some agriculture still. But there's so many communities outside of Boulder that are the same size as Boulder, where people are living and kind of have made new cities. And, you know, there's probably not much more of that that can be built. That's why I lived in Boulder was because I was going for almost uh, some recreational tours. And to a certain extent, I was training for my season. And there were a lot of trails and obvi obviously good places yeah. to run. And it's in high altitude, too, so that you can go back to Texas and be like the you know, mega runner who's... I tell you, running on Magnolia Road a lot up in the mountains and the Walker Ranch Loop, I, I can tell you that there's a, a lot to be gained from changing your oxygen blood levels. Absolutely, <laughs> when yeah. I, when I got back to sea level, I was feeling much better yeah. uh, than I would have if I would have just trained at sea level, which is amazing. And if people say it helps, and I, I found out that it actually does. <laughs> I mean, it's a really beautiful place too. And I think that part of the question about Yimbyism is who gets to live in these beautiful places? You know, Boulder has the most trails, the most bike paths per capita in the U.S. And, you know, it's really blessed with these amazing places that you can go, you know, do a day hike really easily. You can like go to work and like go hiking or go mountain biking right after work. And I wish that there was more communities that saw the benefits of buying public land and using that land for recreation. Unfortunately, there's not. There's a lot of private land in this country. And there's a lot of like private land with do not trespass, we will shoot you signs. And that's why people want to move to Boulder, because there's only there's only a couple places like that. And those assets that are community assets are very tightly held community assets. So, you know, they are public, but becoming part of that public is very difficult. It's interesting because they are valuable and I feel like more cities should have done it, but not for the reasons necessarily that Boulder did it, right? They were trying to constrain growth rather than create an amenity for residents. It ended up being an amenity, right? And beneficial. And I, those hiking and biking trails are amazing. And I wish every city had that. I mean, it reminds me of, of where I grew up in, in Kingwood. And I've talked about this a number of times on the podcast, but for some reason, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of this, and I still don't quite under, understand why, but for some reason, when they built the development, they put bike trails behind the houses that probably, you know, go, you know, 70 miles or something like that. And you can get anywhere in the, in the, in the neighborhood, which is a very sprawling, you know, suburb of Houston, but you can get anywhere in the neighborhood by riding a bike on these trails. And you're not necessarily crossing big roads because they put tunnels under them. And I feel like that kind of design would be beneficial for cities to create something that actually allows people to get around without driving their car. And in Boulder specifically, it's interesting because there's all these recreational opportunities from that too. And there's a benefit to that. But there was not a lot of foresight in city planning in the past to do that. There's parks and stuff, and there's things like Central Park and Olmsteads were all over the place, as you mentioned in the book. 
But this kind of thinking about, you know, green belts and, and the idea of building places where people can be that aren't, you know, residential areas is really beneficial. But I, I feel like that's lost on some of the urban planning history, mostly because people were trying to use it as, as a way to constrain growth and worried about, you know, more people rather than actually providing people with something beneficial. Yeah, I mean, Boulder, I, I love the idea of making a green belt to limit suburban sprawl. And I I do really identify with Ebenezer Howard's vision that he put forward in the early 20th century. I'm actually doing a project about that now. The problem is in Boulder and most other places, it just didn't work, which is that, you know, they said in the early 1970s, we've bought all this land, we had this green belt. What people did is they just immediately went past the green belt and they drove back and forth every day, spewing emissions all over the green belt and built suburban sprawl past the green belt, because that's what happens when you don't have a kind of regional plan to work these things out, which is actually something that Ebenezer Howard talks about in the theory of green belts, and unfortunately never came to fruition in the UK or the US. Boulder also didn't really care about rising house values. You know, the fact that house values there were, you know, rising really steadily because of the green belt and then really going out of control in the 1990s and and beyond, no one really cared. It was kind of like, oh, it's a win-win. Most people are homeowners here. And so the affordability issue was not front and center at all. People were very happy that their house had doubled in value and tripled in value, et cetera. And they were happy for everyone else to go live in Longmont or Louisville or Superior or wherever. And they didn't get the recreational, and let's say those cities are, are bad, that a lot of them are actually really nice, but they didn't get the same kind of recreational jewels that Boulder has. And also, like, there's a lot of economic segregation when you do that. When you have, here's this kind of support cities, here's the big, expensive, like, luxury city, which Boulder has absolutely become in the same sense as Aspen or something like that. And here's the support cities where everyone else lives who serves that city. But in a case, in the case of Boulder in places like Aspen, it's not just like the people who, you know, have not very like jobs that don't pay a lot, like who wash dishes or who are like maids in a hotel or something. It's like everyone, it's like everyone, you know, the college professors, like business people, like everyone has to move. And that's a huge danger when you get a place that has a kind of zero growth policy. But I, I do agree. Yeah, there's there's a lot of, you know, Boulder is an example of these kind of parks done in a really visible way. But there's a lot of great smaller examples of people making bike paths, um, using kind of interstitial areas of land that weren't connected and then connecting them and making little horizontal parks like linear parks and then bike paths. And it's really easy to do also using public funds and not even using eminent domain but just buying up some property and making a path that connects the city. And and there's a lot of good examples of places that have done that and created some really nice spaces and some options to use alternative forms of transportation. Was there anything that you learned from doing the research for this book that you didn't expect to find out or things that surprised you when you were talking to people, when you're doing the research, thinking about yimbyism and nimbyism and all the isms in between? Hmm, That's a good question. You know, the most surprising thing to me was that this term is of global importance because I think everyone knows that American suburbia is a weird thing. It's a sort of, you know, the the extent of suburbia, the unique history of suburbia in the United States. I think that that can be named. It can be something that we really think of as a uniquely American experiment, whether you think it's a failed or successful experiment. But I was really surprised that people are using this term and talking about single family homes in the UK in cities like Brighton, Bath and London and Manchester, in Sweden, Australia. Part of that I think is because in the US we have such a, we think of suburbia and we think of not in my backyard thinking very much in racial terms too. I think we think about integration about restricted covenants that wouldn't let Black people, Jews, sometimes Italian-Americans into certain suburban neighborhoods. And also you think about the kind of suburbia that was built in a pattern of white flight from increasingly diverse and integrated 
uh, urban cores. And so, you know, for me, it was, it was weird to go to places like Brisbane and Queensland and Northern Australia and see them using this language. And I think it's a kind of testament to the power of this idea for thinking about densification and thinking about new ways of housing. So that was, that was surprising to me. And I think it's a powerful idea that has been received with great attention in a lot of places across the world. I think that was interesting about the international cases was that people were saying that the term itself, and it has a bit of baggage, right? Especially as it pertains to California's Yimbyism, but there was like an inherent value in the term itself for explaining kind of what people meant. And I think that that makes it a very valuable term for activists that are using it to, you know, get to the points that they want to make. Yeah, it does have baggage. And um, I think that arguably some people will not continue to use it because of how loud the debates have gotten in California particularly. But I do think that it's become a shorthand for a number of ideas about densification, about building more, about zoning that has been really useful for people, despite having zoning laws that are really different from the United States. You know, it's, it's a kind of pro-urban mindset. And I think that's easier for people outside of the U.S. who are more comfortable living in cities where, you know, living in an apartment is a more normal thing. But I think in the U.S. it's been really powerful shift also to say, you know, yeah, it's okay to live a more urban lifestyle. It's not more dangerous. It's not more stressful. You can have a car. You can have kids and live in an apartment. You won't be a bad parent. And there's a lot of ideas that we've kind of internalized in the United States about anti-urbanism that I think until this movement came around, we're almost reflexive. And I think now we've had some time to meditate on them and maybe change our minds. What do you think the future is moving forward for these housing activists one way or another? What's the next steps? Do you think that we become a very urban society? Do you think that it all falls apart? I'm curious what your thoughts are on what's next. Remote work and the pandemic are huge challenges. You know, I think that people would say before the pandemic, yeah, okay, this is all going to happen. But now, you know, you, you see people who during the pandemic moved you know, to Montana or something and, you know, are doing their work for a firm in Los Angeles from Missoula, that could be a game changer, but only for a kind of certain kind of white collar job. So, you know, not for everyone, probably for far less than 10% of people. I think there also will have to be public spending in housing that is more energy efficient, particularly in terms of insulation. As energy prices become a giant problem with the Russia-Ukraine war, I also think that probably we're on the verge of a recession and there's not going to be as much free capital floating around in big, expensive American cities, but there still will be a housing crisis. And so you might see more government involvement when it comes to not just giving Section 8 vouchers or some sort of mixed like nonprofit housing, but actually potentially building new public housing if this crisis goes on longer. But I think the Yimbyism is here to stay, particularly in terms of urban densification. So building cities that are a lot bigger and that have higher buildings and people living closer together and not being afraid of doing it. Well, the book is Yes to the City, Millennials in the Fight for Affordable Housing. Where can folks find a copy if they want to get one? You can get one uh, online from Princeton University Press, and it ships all over the U.S. and all over the world as well. Awesome. Well, Max, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Overhead Wire and published first at Streets Blog USA. Thanks to our wonderful Patreon supporters for sponsoring this week's show and Mondays at The Overhead Wire. Find us at patreon.com slash The Overhead Wire. And you can sign up for our 16-year-old newsletter at TheOverheadWire.com. And you can also listen to our show on your podcatcher of choice, including Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, and Apple Podcasts. And if you can't find it there, you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. We'll see you next time at Talking Headways.